uh, Michael is, d needs no introduction. He's a, a world-renowned composer um, and pianist and um, uh, is, you know, among the leading composers of his generation in any country, not, not, not merely in Britain. Um, so it's a great honor to have him um, take part in our symposium today. Um, because it's only about 9.55 in the morning where he is. And we've decided to put the keynote speech at the end of the day rather than at the beginning. So, but I think actually this works very well because this is the climax of the whole day. Um, not to give you any pressure, Michael. <laughs> no, um, um, so, I think uh, when you're Ready to begin? We can begin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is a keynote address, and I'm advised by that most accessible agent of information, Google, that the principal aims of such an address are to arouse unity and enthusiasm at the end of the day and to focus on issues of primary interest to those gathered together in conference. The address will be in three parts, each roughly 10 minutes long. The first part contains some very general reminders about our work, stuff that we forget, and responsibilities, the hard graft of composition itself. The second will carry some remarks about the reception, typically given to creative writing. Responses to what we, or people like us, have put out there into the world. The third updates some general conceptions about contemporary critical discourse and new aesthetic categories. These are the weapons carried by our judges. We happen to be in the midst of a global pandemic and we are locally under the different protective restrictions of lockdown. We are fortunate. As practicing composers, we are probably less impeded than many people from following our usual work practice. We typically work alone at a desk with pens, pencils and paper or a computer screen for company. We are disadvantaged from being unable to easily rehearse our music with other people or to bring it to live performance in a public arena, such as a concert hall. But these embargoes should not prevent our imagination and intellect from taking exercise. Our brain is a muscle and it needs to be kept in trim. We function under the generic title composer we are unified by possessing, by possessing the special gift of being able to imagine sounds and write them down or otherwise record them, and also to structure them in some way by bringing them into interesting and satisfying relationships with each other. <coughs> interesting and satisfying are contentious terms. Structure as a noun or verb also requires further debate or discussion. But it's certainly perceived as an outcome of the activity of forming, like in pottery, maybe. Form makes a rather better verb than a noun. Terminology, though, is always an issue. The word composition actually implies bringing stuff together. In Latin, compositio means an arrangement, a system, and a reconciliation. In French, visual artists still refer to objet composé, objects placed together in an aesthetically pleasing arrangement. Pleasing arrangements and reconciliations may be disavowed in some circumstances. Systematic arranging according to convention or mathematical rationales is also a way of bringing things together. 
In bringing stuff together in music, we might benefit from also considering what that stuff is. Stuff we sometimes refer to more elegantly as material. Material is usually assumed to simply mean pitches and rhythms, but it could also be understood as the instrument, the piano or the violin, or that instrument's characteristic repertoire, or a concept like emptiness, clutter, or evenly spaced chords. We should consider how and why this material excites our interest and, as we are working in a time-based activity, how we might explore it in time. Even letting it be or allowing it to spontaneously react without preconditioning. If you are at all politically minded or concerned with your role in wider society, the community or the culture you inhabit, and I think we all should be, then think about how your music might make itself clear. By clear, I mean distilled to a point of maximal clarity. I certainly do not mean simple or simplified for popular consumption. I will return tangentially to this topic in part three with reference to current aesthetic categories and values. As I'm sure you already know, it is not possible to teach composition. The impulse to imagine sound is inherent. The desire to work with this impulse is rare and rarely understood. It is, nevertheless, possible to teach how to work with the imagined but still raw material. The most common and simplest way is to model music on its own past. A past typically institutionalized and approved by a consensus of opinion. Music can be modeled by analogy on a poem or a painting or a traffic jam, a steel factory in action, or the dawn chorus of birds singing or clouds moving, the sea, thunderstorms and so on. This, at best, requires analytical skills and accurate observation. Sentiment is not enough. Impressionism and Expressionism were both revolutionary concepts <coughs> excuse me, in painting. Both concepts were also drawn from complex scientific theories about light and color and some heavyweight philosophizing. So if you're going to use Impressionism and Expressionism, just remember the scientific theories behind it and the philosophies. The past needs investigation and opinion should always be challenged. You have to challenge the past. We should be active as artists and not believe any information about our discipline, including what I'm now saying, in a spirit of passive
the band of the Norwegian Air Force, if I remember rightly. <clears throat> I am writing this in the UK, where the best known and most enduring cultural export is William Shakespeare. Not a composer, but still someone who worked with pen and paper, sound, rhythm and structuring information. He was, as you must know, a playwright and a poet. Shakespeare was so revered in the 19th century that it was widely thought that he wrote as if by magic, without any need of correction or revision. As much as anything else, this imagined ability raised him above other writers and rendered him a genius. Film biographies of famous composers like Beethoven or Chopin have kept this falsified view of creativity alive in more recent times. Strangely enough, it was already known and accepted that Shakespeare had drawn his topics from historical sources or the works of older Italian and French writers. And indeed, after the practice of ancient Greek playwrights, whose audiences already knew the plot of the play as it was drawn from commonplace historical incident or mythology. What was admired here was the treatment, the particular viewpoint or dramatic angle taken by the author. What mattered was the way in which things were told, rather than the simple what of the story that was so apparent in the telling. More recent scholarship has revealed that from first to last, Shakespeare actually drafted earlier versions of several of his most famous plays. This does not now cancel his reputation, of course, but it shifts the emphasis away from the invention of stories onto the writing process itself. The way the stories are transcribed and adapted, in other words, this shift in emphasis is significant and as composers, we should try to reduce the amount of time spent on inventing material. We should invest in inventing striking and original ways of working with material, exploring it and transforming it. Composers need not be afraid of making mistakes or having to reassess and rewrite. Making mistakes is as good a way to learn as anything else. One should not be ashamed of getting things wrong. Think, here is a simple exercise devised by Morton Feldman. Make a composition with only the notes A and B. Imagine a class full of students doing this. After listening to the mostly loud and extravagant displays of ingenuity for several minutes, Morton Feldman would walk over to the piano and play as an extremely quiet dyad, the lowest B and the highest A on the keyboard. Sound, he would say after a long pause, is not something you should be able to walk past. This last statement was borrowed from a painter friend who told him that a good painting was not something you could walk past. Bear this statement in mind when you next visit an art gallery and watch, perhaps with despair, as people pause in front of a painting, identify its subject in five seconds or less and walk on to the next painting. Our needs and concerns might be substantially different to those of our audience, but is our work complete before it is listened to? When I was still teaching at Southampton University, it was a regular occurrence to find at least one student in every year's intake anxious about their own originality, 
and concerned that this was being suppressed by the apparent jumble of music facts and techniques that needed to be assimilated. I do wonder whether Shakespeare experienced the same crises in confidence, or did he have sufficient nerve that the need to write pushed aside everything else before it? As you might already have guessed from the references to Shakespeare and to painting, I do not believe it is healthy for music to exist in isolation. Indeed, my next reference is to a film director. His work follows in the tradition of what is now called, often disparagingly, at least in England, art house movies. His name is Julian Hernandez, and his titles, like Raging Sun, Raging Sky, indicate something of the atmosphere and passion of his work. He has this to say about their structure. My narratives are intended to be disruptive, fragmented. I try to free myself from the clarity of plot and invent a different structure in which I abandon the established grammar for a state of mind. I tell you this partly as it is a statement I could still make about my own work. We all need to know how to make clear-headed statements about what we are doing or have done. Otherwise, our work is likely to be misread and misunderstood. Here is a statement from another film artist writing in 1929. And this is quoted at the head of Stefan Schleimacher's first CD of Soviet avant-garde piano music. In the realm of art, the dialectic principle of dynamics is embodied in conflict. Conflict as the fundamental principle. For art is always conflict, according to its social mission, according to its nature, according to its methodology. This statement is signed Say Eisenstein. He was attempting to animate the intelligence of everyday people through unfamiliar images, thoughts and sounds. The challenge of his viewpoint was as vulnerable then in an emergent Soviet Union as it is now in the deceitful and inhospitable marketplace mentality of commodification, where, interestingly, the rhetoric is almost identical. Our dumbed down culture has actually gone soft in the head. It's become complicit and fearful. It seems to be lying down with its legs in the air, waiting for its tummy to be rubbed. The questions to ask might be, do I want to be a part of a wider community? Do I dare risk sharing my work with other people? What and how much should I share? If you want to be a part of a community which contains other composers, how do you relate to them? Take courage and learn to listen to others. What can you share of your work? Have confidence in it, but perhaps best not to give too much away. Hold something in reserve. How do we share what we know and feel? Remember that in the 21st century, great emphasis is placed on advertising. The world does not owe you a living. Unfortunately, even people in positions of authority cheat and tell lies. So try to have a clear sense of ethical and moral responsibility and behavior. We might be special as composers, but will anybody care?
I think it was Stravinsky who replied to the question, for whom do you write? By saying, I write for myself and a hypothetical other. For those of us still working with non-hypothetical others who are performing musicians, we must use tact, imagination, and above all, respect. In Buzani's account of music's social continuum, the composer transcribes vision and thought into notation. The performer transcribes the notation into living sound. And the audience transcribes that living sound into some kind of experience. Professional music commentary on our work, if any, is likely to come from academics and musicologists, or less likely to use their imagination, tact and respect, music critics. We must hope that critics have some kind of musical knowledge and that this might be assisted by what composers feed them. They might also have fed from the rich table of aesthetics. Here is a short list of the aesthetic categories to which our critics can refer. Please remember, aesthetics is very unstable territory. Firstly, there are the classical categories, sublime and beautiful. Sublime and beautiful, either moral, religious, political, or epistemological. These categories are hardly ever applied to modern composition. About a hundred years further on from classicism in history, Nietzsche tells us we have been able to create forms long before knowing how to create concepts. Indeed, form is a much abused word. Formalistic came under serious fire from the Soviet Politburo in 1948, when it was considered that formal abstraction was becoming of greater interest to the composer than humanistic content. It is an idea which nowadays regularly surfaces in attacks on modernism. The date of the Soviet Bureau in, in 1948 the date is not incidental. In 1948, it might have been apparent to Soviet intelligence that the CIA were giving financial support to avant-garde composers in Europe to promote the concept of freedom. By that time, we had been told that form was the antithesis of matter, what seems rather than what is. The free West also promoted culture as a realm in its own right and the source of art's incorrigible ambiguity, according to Adorno and Marcuse. In the UK, culture refers mainly to sport and vacuous celebrity. When our government finally acknowledged COVID-19 and recommended lockdown conditions for survival, someone high up in the government suggested a campaign for those in the arts to retrain for a career in information technology. One of the posters in this campaign showed a ballerina with the slogan, rethink, reskill, Reboot. Fatima's next job could be in cyber. She just doesn't know it yet. From Little Britain, we jump across the Atlantic to Daniel Harris and styles of commercial culture. This is unbelievably aesthetic. These are cute, quaint, romantic, and even in the land of, land of the free, Hungry is the title of the book, incidentally. A small sideways jump 
takes us into postmodernist consumer aware aesthetics, where cute has held its place, at least according to Sian Ngai, along with zany and interesting. Thank you for your attention. I hope you have had a terrific, stimulating and energizing conference. Thank you for listening. No, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michael Finnessy. That's all right. Uh, wonderful, moving and profound talk. Um, and Just a few things, things to talk about, I think. Absolutely. And for me, the you know, a very good summation of many things which we talked about during the day, uh, in fact. Um, so maybe there'll be a number of uh, issues and themes which we can reprise with you here. Mm -hmm. um, who would, and I see lots of people are set, typing messages uh, <laughs> in the chat. Um, who would like to start off with a comment or a question for Michael? Oh, one thing I should point out is I'd, li I'd like to thank um, uh, Zhang Yanyu and Chou Xingzi uh, for helping me with the translation of Michael's uh, keynote speech, um, which uh, was done with great alacrity in the course of not more than 24 hours. Um, so thank you to uh, Yuan Yu and Xing Si for helping me with that. I wouldn't have been able to do it without them. And I see that Jorgis Sakelario has put his hand up. Jorgis. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, yeah, if I can confess, these are those thoughts that have been troubling me for many years now. Uh, especially this key question, who are we composing for? Who is listening? That, that's kind of like my emphasis. Um, and anyway, it's usually quite annoying where a question is, uh, uh, until the question is like a five minute monologue about things. So I'll cut right, right to the chase. I'm very pessimistic and I, I have a feeling that composers will be obsolete in a few years. Society won't need them. Society won't need them. A new masterpiece, who cares? Or even our presence in the society is really not needed anymore, spiritually, practically, aesthetically. And I think pretty soon higher education will also stop any sort of support in arts and humanities in order to uh, promote more practical uh, professions Honestly, I don't see us existing in maybe 15, 100 years. Uh, what's your opinion about this? Am I too pessimistic or there is a light in the end of the tunnel? Thank you much again. I think the light at the end of the tunnel is the few people, but it's always been a few people, Yorgis, who do like, do understand, at least at some level, what we are doing. It's very easy and a lot of academics are now saying, oh, this is the last era of composed music and um, thank, thank them for their support, I don't think. Uh, I think we're under the same pressures as religion. And I think for very much the same reason, what we offer is a kind of spiritual nourishment, which it's very difficult to quantify economically. And as long as the influence uh, generally, as long as the emphasis rather is on profit, economics, viability in the marketplace and so on, we're going to spend an awful lot of our lives chasing after the phantoms of success and whatever it is that we're supposed to be seeking. 
I don't have any answers. I have lots of questions. And like you, I'm I'm very preoccupied by the state of my country in the UK, where there is virtually no mention, even of classical composers like Beethoven or Mozart. Um, I think we just have to carry on uh, because this seems to be the way in which things survive in history. And even if we don't survive, we will have had the satisfaction of trying to do something. I don't think we should just give up and shut up shop. No, that was almost a five minute monologue, sorry. <laughs> No, usually the five minute monologues are from the ones who ask the questions, <laughs> whereas the important thing is for the keynote speaker to share their thoughts even further. Uh, George, is it okay if I do like a follow up quick question? I'm, I'm sure there are many people, so I can just, okay, thank you. Uh, well, I see this in two ways. I, I have seen a lot of composers recently uh, being more interested in becoming like social facilitators like workshopping with small um, numbers of people and kind of like engaging in common actions rather than producing the work, the ergon, the product, the noun, the dead thing. Because I'm sure from uh, the presentation, you understand that this division form and matter is you know, a, a classical Western concept, which is not really accurate. So that's one thing that I see as a way of, let's say, surviving and moving forward. And the next question that I have for you is that, uh, of course, in these environments, you know, we can talk about what's known as academic composition, and there's this accusation of being so marginalized deliberately. And sometimes I wonder, why is that so bad? I mean, I, I'd rather be in a marginalized, uh, self-referential community of interest where people at least show dedication and interest rather than making this attempt to necessarily uh, appeal to the broader masses. And that's not a statement, that's again a question for you. And again, thank you very much. No, I, I, I agree with you. I, I, I don't want to bite the hand that feeds me, as we say here. Um, there is a, because we're held to account mostly by the press and the media of not appealing to mass audiences. But did Bach ever appeal to a mass audience? Did Beethoven appeal to a mass audience? When Beethoven's Ninth Symphony was first played in London, somebody reviewed it saying that it sounded like animals escaping from a zoo. And the mythology around Beethoven's late string quartets was legendary in the 19th century. So I think we should just get on with it and stop reading the newspapers. I'm perfectly happy to have pieces played outside of the concert hall in other venues. I don't think we should hold on to the sacred status of music unless we particularly want to. And we just have to take our chances. I mean, it's it, it's taken me a lifetime, I suppose, to formulate this attitude, if that's what it is, and in fact earn the right to write music in the way that I want to write it. Because regardless of what anybody says, you do have to jump through hoops and prove yourself. I mean, one of the tests is write an orchestral piece. Another one is go and meet the public. And we have to solve these sometimes quite ridiculous tasks. Historically, Chopin was condemned for not writing well for the orchestra. I mean, it's if you read this stuff, with any degree of intensity, it just does your head in, you know. I, you cannot believe how stupid the critics are. And I don't think musicologists are always quite so far behind the critics in making wrong assumptions about stuff. So basically protect yourself. That's why I said, you know, don't give everything away. Save something which is special 
to you that enables you to get excited about what you're doing. I deeply love the work of David Hockney and also what David Hockney says about his work. And the word he uses most frequently, and he's now well into his 80s, and he's still working every day. How does he do that? Because it excites him to do it. It's like, basically, sorry for this uh, analogy, which is just about to come up, but basically it's like sex. If you don't enjoy it, you're probably not doing it right. And writing is like that. If you can't get excited and passionate about what you're writing, maybe it's time to go and make a cup of tea and come back later when you are excited and stimulated by it. I think this does actually, the excitement communicates to an audience. I think they understand if we're excited, enchanted, thrilled by what we're doing, that communicates and it's more important than knowing the technical apparatus. That was a, that was a blind alley, I think, that composers of the 50s and 60s went up and uh, god knows it's it, you know they did fascinating work i'm not decrying decrying that but the technical apparatus was so far in front of anything else and that's not what the average citizen of the world is ever going to be able to identify with that's that's for us to talk about at these conferences thank you so much my pleasure Next question. <laughs> I'm reminded actually by both by Jorgis's question and Michael's reply of um, something that uh, Kaikoshu Sarabji said. Um, some, I'm paraphrasing, but it's something along the lines of he didn't care if there were only 10 people in the world that appreciated his piano sonatas because if they really did appre appreciate them then that meant that he had a you know he had a, an audience for his his music some an audience that really appreciated his his work um michael do you i wonder how do you react to that kind of sentiment do you endorse that sentiment or would you modify it in some way? Um, well, these days, because the internet, if you, if you have a website, the internet gives people access to you in a way that perhaps nervousness at a concert prevents them from asking you about what, what you do. And I would say, a couple of times a week, two times a week, on average, people write to me and ask about a particular thing. And I'm always happy to answer, however banal the question is, about the music, make it accessible, um, send them a copy of it or refer them to a publisher who, I mean, I'm lucky, I've got a very good publisher right now, and they're happy to send you know, a page or two or a whole piece uh, to somebody who, who's, who's interested and they don't have to be celebrities and megastars, you know. They, uh, so I, I'm not sure. I, I kind of don't want to know who, who listens because I'm, I'm more excited about writing the next piece, quite honestly. I, I just like to move on. I don't want to sit and bask in the glow of critical praise and, uh, and reception. That's, it's a bit of, oh, it's not a waste of time, but it can distract you. And I, I, I do try and avoid distractions. I mean, I, I've, you know, in the few remaining years, as it were, proportionally speaking, 
as you get older, you realize that time is precious. And of course, it's nice to be liked, but hey, I, I have a responsibility to write music. That's what I, I think I was put here to do. It's virtually the only thing I can do um, on a daily basis with any sense of involvement. So uh, that's it. Professor Tong. Your microphone is turned off. My microphone, microphone is is mute. Okay, now I remember uh, a, a question briefly. I remember 1996 or 97, the ISCM in Manchester. Yes, mm -hmm. you premiere your uh, great opera piece. It's a memory to an uh, extent, right? And uh, my question is: That also a kind of a social responsibility for you? Yeah, I think I, I think there's a social aspect to everything one writes, whether it's particularly social emphasized or whether it's very private, because very early on we we have a way of transmitting our inner thoughts publicly it's a it's a kind of rhetoric and i don't think about it um it's not i don't think one needs to underline i am writing this for so you know for, for a social reception I, I mean, there are, there are enough pressures already inside my head, you know. Um, why did you? Why? What is behind the question? Mm, no, I just want to to listen more, and uh, I hope you can mention a little bit more. Because it's a memory to an extent. What is the extent? I, I forget. That's a ship extent. In, yeah. in. It, it wasn't my composition. The, the piece you're referring to, which is just a wonderful piece, is by Gavin Bryars. It's by Gavin Bryars and it's called The Sinking of the Titanic. Yes. Which, was one of the biggest disasters in shipping history um and it was a performance with a group of amateur musicians non non-professional unskilled yes i remember and uh, the head of this organization who's a wonderful person is called chris surety and Chris Surety and I decided that, if possible, we would do this on a ship which we knew was going to be in, uh, in the part of the port of Manchester. And that we would use the, that environment, and it was quite yes. crowded and, and cramped in there. So that was an incident where a, a concert hall would not have worked because the ship made such an impact, just the discomfort of being on a ship and realizing that those people who died in that tragedy in 1912 or 10 or whenever it was, um, it was something of the feeling. And actually it was extremely difficult to perform for emotional reasons that afternoon because we became so involved in what we were doing and it became so horribly real and one of the great skills of the of the piece is that many many different versions of it are possible he doesn't specify perform it on a ship but you have that option and we just decided to take it to that 
extreme, if you like. I don't think it's ever been done like that before. And I would be uncomfortable about <laughs> about trying so, to do it again. I, I got so wound up that afternoon. I mean, the players were crying at the end because we, we just became so animated. Thank you. And I remember it's, it's also just where it's, where it's short time, uh, probably yeah. before one year. There is a... The the, the 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 violent in, in Manchester of the uh, Irland Irland Guard or something the mm. the is behind the piece is also an inconsistent inconsistent or some related some refer to that uh, that extent I mean the violent of uh, Irland uh, Irland Guard. Do you yeah. the uh, the IRA bombing is it? Yes, yes, IRA Manchester bombing. Manchester. Was was that in the, around that in, time? Yes, I think it probably was. I we just never know, do we, what what the social and political circumstances of a performance might be. And unfortunately, it's very tempting to cash in you know, to vulgarize uh, a public incident like, an, uh, like a bomb going off in the middle of a, a city. And during that time, there were many incidents where the level of um, panic, maybe the level of awareness of, of, of paranoia, insecurity were emphasized. In general, people then turn to music to act as a kind of um, comfort, you know, like having a cup of hot chocolate or a, a big fancy cake or, so, or something, or some, something that's going to calm their, their nerves down. And the interesting thing about Briars is I think he's very aware of, of the social environments in which his, his piece is may be played and in the sinking of the titanic what he uh, let me tell you the story when the titanic went down when it sank when it began to sink the orchestra that was on board played hymn tunes particularly abide with me which is a, a hymn tune played here at a lot of funerals I, it was played i mean almost every funeral at that time before the first world war and for many years afterwards always would include this this hymn tune but he slows it down to an extraordinary extent as if i don't know it's like some dreadful moment of 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 time that you can't really escape from and that's where the skill of the music begins to come in. Not the fact that it's about the Titanic or it's about anything else, but that he can take a musical gesture and expand it so that it, it's, it's like 20 times as impactful as it would be under normal circumstances. And also it's very, because the hymn tune is very, it's very simple, it's very beautiful, um, there's nothing terribly unusual about it. So the unusual thing that he's doing, which is what I was uh, trying to, the point I was trying to make in the lecture, is it's not the idea, oh, I'll take a hymn tune and slow it down. That must have been done thousands of times. But the particular way in which he does it makes it seem as if the entire world is falling to bits. When you when you listen to it, it's as if you can feel the ship slowly sinking. It's not literal. It's not stated in the score. It's just a possibility. I mean, mu music is very ambiguous. You know, what does what does that mean? Is it somebody falling off a building? Is it a dog jumping after a stick? Is it a minor thing, a major thing. What is it? Sound is very, very ambiguous. So we we have to 
we have to be enchanted by it. I think we have to see some possibility in it that other people don't. Thank you, thank you very much. Yes. Just one little more anecdote. A, a filmmaker friend of mine was interviewing Ligeti uh, at the time of the premiere of San Francisco Polyphony and asked him, what, what, why is it called San Francisco Polyphony? And Ligeti said, which I completely understand, when he was walking around a city like San Francisco, he didn't, he didn't look so much as hear and the impressions he was receiving through his eyes then produced a sound in his mind. And anybody who knows San Francisco, it's a very strange city. It's built on very steep hills. And it's possible when you're walking around, you turn around a corner and then you're in the middle of dense fog. It, it, I mean, we talk about changeable weather but it's instantaneous in San Francisco sometimes. You can just turn around and you're somewhere else. And the polyphony of events that he was seeing in San Francisco then becomes a polyphony of sound in the orchestra piece. So it's, it's like our identification with the world is in terms of sound, not so much as it is visual we, we we can if we want transmit our our feelings our thoughts our intelligence whatever in terms of sound if it's truthful it'll make a it'll make a make an impression thank you thank you very much but before you mentioned in your piece some ambiguity but yeah. uh, i for me, your your lecture is great and uh, de determinative. Thank you, great lecture. I, I do my best, honestly. <laughs> now we have, uh, in th according to the original timetable, we were due to finish at six, but there's no reason why we have to, except, uh, you know, we'll get hungry eventually. But um, uh, I, I am aware that, uh, you know, there might be people who really want to ask a question of Michael and, uh, and maybe you're not quite, you haven't quite summoned up the courage just yet to ask it. So now is the time if anyone wants to turn on their microphone and speak. Could I uh, ask a question? Yeah, Paul San Gregory, oh. go ahead. Um, I, I might know how you answer this, but I'm curious. Um, just um, we were talk you were just talking about how sound, just how we express ourselves in sound. Hmm. Is there a problem in modern times is that visuals are becoming so important, uh, especially with you know the the push of modern tech a lot of times is you know the new the new video screen or the new, the, you know, cell phones have to have something video on them. Um, is, there, is there a problem, like people don't know how to just use their ears anymore? Is this becoming an issue? Well, I think generally speaking, um, people don't pay atten enough attention um, to what they they're looking at or hearing what we don't do so much is see or listen so if it's possible to encourage friends and students to really listen it doesn't matter whether it's to music I'd, i i mean in, i'd prefer that it was but it's possible to get to, this is, this is the wonder of John Cage's four minutes, 43 seconds, isn't it? That it's a piece which asks you to listen to the environment you're in. And there's so much music 
that is impressive but doesn't have any silence in it. So for me, silence becomes very important in composition because at that moment when the silence is there, I mean, non-rhetorical silence, not a silence maybe like Beethoven where it's tension immediately, but silence which is just there. So the music suddenly disappears and then what do you do? And this is a long silence, not, not three seconds, 25 seconds, that's a heck of a long time. And you're kind of put on the, on the spot of having to listen. And this is, this is what the Feldman story about, I think it's Rauschenberg, um, about not walking past a picture. Because most people think it's enough to identify what the picture is of. You know, it's a tree. Oh, look, it's a cow. Oh, look, it's a couple of people in fancy dress. Uh, and then they walk off, they're satisfied with that. But the idea of a painting is that you look at the way it's been painted. Okay, you identify it, maybe first that, but what one is taught by is the artist's skill at painting. It's not like taking a snapshot. And so many people now take sh snapshots. They're not really looking. I guess we become touristic about the arts, which is very sad. Um, but it's possible to get very dissatisfied with the results of that. I've seen people do it. They get dissatisfied with snapping away and then they have to do something more serious about it. But there's a lack of seriousness about culture in the media. Everything's a joke. I mean, virtually every third person in the UK is, is a stand-up comedian of one sort or another. And it just gets exhausting. Okay, I see that uh, Jorgis has put his hand up and there was also a question from um, Yue Nusham. Hmm? Long Yun, Long Yun. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hello, Michael. Hello. Uh, I'm, hi, I was a primary teacher in Solomon Island. And my student ever uh, have been ever asked me a question is who is the first composer in the world? Who is the first composer in the world? Um, yes. Do you mean in time, historical time? Yes. Who, who composed um, the first? First, yeah. Uh, the first one I know uh, is in the 11th century, and that is Hildegard von Bingham. Um, okay. But the sophistication of her music suggests that there must have there must have been precedents, but uh -huh. anonymity. Um, it forbids us to to acknowledge who these individuals were that might have written before. We know, uh, I mean, history records in Greece, surely in China, because there's a very, very long tradition of music um, in in China. The names of poets are recorded. Um, okay. So possibly in Chinese musical texts. There, there is mm -hmm. some kind of authorship. I don't think it's, I mean, it, of course it's significant. It would be nice to know who the first one was. And, okay. Um, but I, I, I don't think we can really know. <laughs> Hildegard will do for the time being. She, she but, was born in 1090 something. But were, um, were, 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 was someone like Homer, would Homer have counted as a composer in a sense? Because he would have sung his poetry to the accompaniment of a lyre. Well, I guess so. I mean, in the same way as I allowed Shakespeare the role of a composer, because he deals with sound, rhythm, expression, certainly silence. 
Mm -hmm. I, 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 I see that Jorgis wants to ask a question and also yeah. Shen Diaolong. So, uh, so shall we have Jorgis first and then Shen Lao Shi? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Hello again. Actually, it's a bit more related to what Paul was saying earlier. So I see the conversation shifting forward. I don't want to monopolize it. So I'll pass for now. Thank you for okay. giving the opportunity. Let's hear from other people. Okay. Shen Lao Shi. Yes. Uh, so just a comment from Long Yun, the question, who is the first composer? You mentioned who? Uh, or, or Shakespeare also, but now I I, I, I say in Chinese four four thousand years ago or sometimes mm -hmm. there is a great composer also that's high the 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 the, the, the composition is uh, uh, okay I I mentioned that uh, 日出而作, 日入而息, 早景而已,跟跟跟而時,地利與我合合在. I I mentioned that is always the the provoke is four word, four syllable. Mm. Okay, but the melody is la so mi re do la so mi re do la so mi re do la so. It means uh, four to five, the, uh -huh. the, the chain. Okay, that's uh -huh. my comment in very short. Four, that's the, the, the oldest song is 4,000 years ago, almost. Or at least 3,500 3, years ago in China. Oh. Okay, sorry. Okay, thank you, Zen Lao Shi. Thank you. Shen Lao Shi, is there a question? Uh, yes, I'm Diao Longsheng. I'm a musicologist. And uh, um, uh, firstly, I um, I really appreciate uh, Mr. Finney's uh, talk. That was very inspiring. Uh, especially, I saw a lot of, uh, um, yeah, you, you called a lot of uh, musicologists or the other scholars uh, comments. Oh, that's what, I, I, I love those things. And uh, I have the question because one of your um, PPD slides said that uh, uh, professional musical commentaries um, our work uh, is likely come from on um, um, academics and uh, musicologists. Then, as a musicologist, uh, I'm a musicologist, and uh, I, oh, I, I, I must say that we are faced with some predicament to make comment or to do um, to uh, to yeah to write something about composer, uh, especially in uh, modern times. Uh, and I mean uh, after uh, 1945 or, or in the last decades. The problem is, um, mm, I think this uh, we are living in a, a highly tolerant world, and the people don't easily judge what they don't understand. Uh huh. So we don't read or we don't see uh, those um, honest critics reviews like we uh, saw re we read from about Beethoven or Mozart or sh about Schoenberg about Stravinsky. So without those uh, um. Uh, reviews or uh, reaction from the mass. Actually, as, as musicologists, <laughs> we have no material to um, to make a professional judgment or professional analyze. But what we can do sometimes um, is left with um, um, musical analysis. But the musical analysis, yes, we can do a musical analysis, but the, our our musical analysis is usually not better as a composer himself. <laughs> so now, now the musicology is uh, now is trapped in a, in a predicament, as I said before, um, that in analyzing a, a musical work, we are not better than a composer. And then uh, when it comes to making the musical meanings, we lack the um, social reaction from the public. In this case, in this situation, I would like to hear from you, uh, know more about maybe your opinion. How professional, in your opinion, what, how the musicologists in this today's situation can make a constructive um, contribution 
about um, um, uh, composers or contemporaries' work? That's my question. Thank you. Well, firstly, I should apologize for hitting out at musicologists. Actually, one of my very best friends uh, is a musicologist. Um, and I know what the difficulties are, as you say, about commenting on recent work where there is no background information from historical sources and so on. Let, let me ask you what is probably a rhetorical question, so I'll apologize in advance. Um, how many composers do you actually talk to? Have you got friends who are composers? Uh, yes. Um, and, mm. So I that's where you start. If you, have, if you have one friend who is a composer, talk to them about what they do. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the way I uh, recently have conducted to interview them, to talk with them. No, don't uh, interview them, just talk to them informally and find out what they think about what's going on in music. It's likely, of course, to be very biased, like my mm -hmm. talk was. You know, we, we, have a, we have our individual territories, mm -hmm. but try and meet in a very relaxed and informal way to begin with, at least half a dozen, six, meet six composers and talk to them informally. Don't wear your musicologist's hat. <laughs> just, just, just talk to them informally and then have a second meeting and ask them if they could describe how they write, what they write, wh why, why things are important to them, what they care about. And then you'll gradually build up a background. I mean, I, I, my, my musicologist friend is called Tom Irvine, and it so happened that when we were both working at Southampton, yeah. his office in the university was just along the corridor from mine. Yeah. So if I had a break, or if he had a break, he'd come, we'd come in and we'd have a cup of coffee, or we'd talk, or we'd just look at each other's bookshelves and see what was there. And then gradually you build up enough friendly knowledge mm. to talk informally, because that's really what, what we're short of, isn't it? Information. Mm, yeah. I mean, composers are human beings. They don't have some special place on a pedestal somewhere. Unfortunately, history makes Beethoven very remote. Mm, yeah. Doesn't it? You know, did, yeah. we're told, and it's true, I mean, I believe that Beethoven, I believe, believe very profoundly that Beethoven is a, an amazing composer. Yeah. Really right at the start of modernism, I think. Yeah. And there are all sorts of reasons for that, which we haven't got time to go into. But I, I, I live a life, you know, I have a, a noisy dog in the background <laughs> and I, I, you know, I had breakfast this morning, so did Beethoven, you know, maybe Beethoven had a lazy dog too. And is this the reason Beethoven writes so much loud music? I don't know. Is he competing with the universe? Yeah. Did somebody tell him to write fast rather than slow? Yeah. Maybe the questions at first should be banal but then music is a kind of philosophy it's a kind of way of explaining the universe to somebody else but mm. its its means of doing it are primarily sensual yeah so it should actually be very easy to talk to composers because there's already enough vocabulary yeah analysis will kill virtually anything on the planet yeah that's that's very much a last resort or a second to last resort because yeah. analysis is post facto yeah it's after the event for a composer it's de facto it's always at the time you're doing it because as your pen moves across the page yeah. you change what you're doing 
after afterwards is it's much too late to understand how that peace happened yeah yeah thank you for your answer and yeah very interesting yeah i have some um one of my best friends is a composer unfortunately he is not uh, he's not working in 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 taiwan so we haven't communicated with each other for a long time i will call him in the coming days <laughs> Call him and, and get George. George, please give yeah give give my give my email address and write uh, yeah. with with simple you know questions anything. I I'm I have no secrets. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we'll do. I see Bodan Siroid has asked a question in the chat. Bodan, would you like to turn on your microphone and ask it directly? I can see you've turned your microphone on, but there's no sound at the moment. Cool. Yeah. One moment. Technical issues. Okay. <laughs> There's somebody else, uh, Yuqin Li. Yeah, he loves it. Okay. The eating. Oh, we can't hear you either. All right. Suddenly, ah, here we are. Hello, okay, can sorry, you hear me now? Sorry. Are we done? Are we done? Oh, oh. Yes, I believe the sound is working now. Yes, it is. All right. All right. Okay. Okay. We need to. Okay. We have need to have one at a time now. Okay. Let's let's uh, go with Bodan is, first, um, and then let's go with Bodan first. He, will there be any avant-garde in coming decades? If composers or classical contemporary music is decaying, as no one is getting involved, no one is participating, uh, what should we do as a composer? I missed the beginning of the question. Oh, sorry. Um, would there be any avant-garde left in the coming decades if composers or classical contemporary music is decaying? If no one else is participating or getting involved? Um, there, there will always be an avant-garde. There will there will always be reaction and action because do, we're different people. Every everybody is different from everybody else. Um, to some people, uh, the past has its use. To other people, they want to throw it all away. And it's important. Anger is important. Frustration is important pleasure is important so you have to, my only plea if you like please do this please be truthful please be honest and if you are honest somebody will listen it might start with one person and then next week it might be two people then it's three people and then you start multiplying this by 10 but without without honesty, no, nobody will nobody will really care. If you genuinely want to react against what you feel, then you must do it. You must do it. I I, I always think of a very simple example. If if I get off um, a bus somewhere and I need a cup of coffee and it's very crowded so i sit at a table with somebody and if they ask me what i do i say i'm a composer of music for concert hall now i could say i'm a university academic and then they probably understand what it was i did 
I, I could lie and say, I work for an engineering company. But we have, to, we have to start owning up for what it is that we do. We, we are composers. We do something we think is significant. And we can talk to people about it. Of course, there will be an avant-garde. I know the view of the media is that if there were no avant-garde, it would all be much easier. But for goodness sake, do we want it to be easier? I don't want it to be easier. That's not interesting. I want to have problems to solve. Yeah? Take courage. <laughs> yeah. Bodan, are you still there? Yes, I am. Very good. Very okay. Good. okay. Apologies, actually, um, funny enough, my question was related to silence. <laughs> so apologies for the silence, uh, that was crazy. Um, cages for 33 is not silent. Well, um, yeah, the, the actor, actually, I have this book project I'm working on, um, which is based on silence in contemporary composers. Mm -hmm. I've interviewed some of them, like Frederick de Vries, who passed away recently, a Belgian film composer, and uh, also Beat Fury, who, who is, was teaching at Vienna. And um, I was just wondering if you would be interested for me, it would be a really big pleasure to, to maybe have a short conversation on, on this topic and to know uh, what do you think about the usage or the importance of silence in your own music and how have you used it uh, in your works or maybe give some examples of one or two representative works that could be featured in the discussion? Thanks. Quite honestly, it, it would be much more interesting and in depth for you if you, if you send me an email, because I know we're, we're, we're kind of short of time. I'm very fascinated by the use of silence. Um, I think of it in terms of film editing, not conventional Hollywood editing, but the avant-garde film of people like Stan Brakhage and Gregory Markopoulos. And I was very influenced by uh, Markopoulos and Brakhage when I was in my mid-teens. I used to go and see these films at the National Film Theatre. And uh, I have quite a lot to say about that. If you can track it down, um, there is also a wonderful essay about silence, both in contemporary usage and in uh, more classical rhetoric by a Belgian writer, coincidentally, called Eric de Fischer. And if you, if, if, if George, if you give Bodan my, my contact details, then write and I, I will scan Eric's article for you because it's, it's much more articulate than I am. I mean, I can get enthusiastic, but I, uh, you know, Eric, Eric is very analytical. Thank you very much. It's, it's actually an honor. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Silence. <laughs> Michael, I'd, I'd actually really like to ask a question. Um, but, but I'm a bit nervous about asking it because when I studied with you, I studied with you for many years, seven years, I think, in total. It took me that long to finish the PhD. Um, and the, well, with the masters at the, before it, um, sometimes, sometimes I think students will have sort of secret pieces that they don't show their teachers because they sort of feel that maybe their teachers wouldn't approve of, of the piece or, uh, wouldn't, maybe it's not the sort of piece that the, that teacher can really help the student with or something like that. Um, so I'm interested in, the, in, in those contentious categories that you, you brought up early in the talk. Um, one was, I think, satisfying. Hmm. Um, and the other, I forget at the moment. 
Um, but the one that I'm particularly interested in is satisfying. Um, now, what, apart from a kind of deep intellectual satisfaction that one gets uh, and a kind of joy from really deep, profound music, is there a space in a composer's creativity for a, a more s simple or relaxed kind of satisfaction, just a piece um, which, um, which maybe doesn't challenge conventions in any special way, uh, rather sort of inhabits conventions, um, but does it in a beautiful and pleasing way. Maybe pleasing was the other category. Um, is there space in a composer's work for that kind of piece? Um, I guess so, yes, why not? I, the only thing is about um, words like satisfying and pleasing is that they could also be manifestations of some kind of um, self-satisfaction or self-pleasing. Um, and music is essentially, it's a dialogue, I think, rather than a monologue. Now, of course, one can make a, a very good case for the monologue idea. But I think, however, whatever depth in a, in a piece this happens, I think the composer doesn't write and work on, on something, because after all, it takes quite a long time to make a chain of dots across a piece of paper. So at some level, the composer does want that exterior hypothetical other person that Stravinsky talks about to take some interest in it. I mean, I, very early on, I, I knew Brian Fernio, I st still in contact with him, and we are kind of oppos opposite. He has a, um, he is more, I think, or was more self-contained. And perhaps his music is more like monologue, the, a, a philosophical discourse without the presence of other, other things, other, other, other people, um, or at least, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to disclose things about Brian Fernio. It's up to you to get in, in touch with him if you, if you want to know. Um, but for me, music is, is a kind of conversation, maybe with an imaginary person, but in that conversation, you are bringing something out. You do pay attention to, uh, I guess their conventions, habits, protocols of talking to somebody else to, to, ex to exchange information. This is why I would talk about rhetoric because the rhetoric we use uh, in a public place, like the rhetoric I'm, I'm using now, because I'm talking to a group of people, and that rhetoric would be different, if you can recall, when we were sitting together in my office in Southampton. It's, it's about punctuation and indeed how we use silence and how we use anything, what words we choose in music, what conventions we use or, or refer to. And part of, um, part of the satisfaction is knowing that it, it, it's, made, it's met its, its impact, it's, it's, it, it, it's been uh, successful. I mean, one way I measure did, did, my, did my talk have any impact at all is that there are these questions. And so that, I mean, it's very simple, really, on one level, to 
to know how 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 it works the the, the thing the thing about teaching is um removing the need for things to be secret i mean in in, in a way i would i would hate to find out that people were composing vast numbers of secret pieces but if you study composition in a university uh, there are the university protocols there are there is this terrible business about it being an examination so you're not only being evaluated by the person you've gone to study with but you're also being evaluated by an outside examiner and somebody else on the campus who doesn't know you and I mean talk about pressure that that certainly does put you under pressure and a lot of people I mean a lot of creative artists are very sensitive we re we have to be we have to be vulnerable and that that throws the whole business into a very distorted state personally i would do away with examinations in forever i don't i don't think it's a good way to to do it some people love it of course because actually usually the same kind of people who win first prizes at competitions because their aim is to compete rather than write the music so they work out how to write a prize winning piece I'm not so fond of those sorts of people. They're not very interesting to teach. I should add that I never wrote any secret pieces when I was studying. I'm very relieved to hear it because we worked together, as you say, for, for a considerable period of time. And there were times, obviously, there were times when it became tense and I had then to work to... Uh, either cut you down to size, as we say, um, or remove your insecurities in some way to, to address. Um, I mean, it's it, it, uh, teaching, teaching somebody how to handle the music they instinctively want to write is a lot like psychotherapy. Oops. Okay, I think we, I get the feeling that this might have to be the last question. Um, um, is it, who has, who has put their hand up? TR. Ah, Lin Chenjun. Lin Chenjun. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Hello, Michael. It's been Hello. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you for your speech. It's very inspiring. And um, as a singer, I'm not a composer, I'm a singer. And do you have any uh, advice or the opinion for the a singer who is doing the avant-garde music? Because as I, I train as an opera singer, but I'm very keen, keen on for the uh, um, contemporary and avant-garde music. So I would like to have some uh, thinking about from your uh, point of view. I would have liked to have been a singer too. <clears throat> when I was growing up, I listened, well, I still listen to lots of opera. I love Verdi, for example. Verdi is one of my favorite composers. And um, when I was a child, I really wanted to be a coloratura soprano. And in my secret, there is a secret cell, not so secret because I'm telling you, um, there is a self um, where I am a coloratura soprano. I, I go out and I do Lucia de Lammermoor one night and then I, I come back and do um, Queen of the Night or something like that. Always things with extremely high notes. Um, unfortunately, and typically for a male, something happens in your early teens which prevents you fairly definitively from becoming a high coloratura soprano and i unlike the castrati of the 18th century i wasn't really prepared to have the operation to maybe allow that to happen 
what I'm what I'm saying in this fantasy is that I think I enjoy writing music for voice more than any other kind of music. First of all, and this is about dialogue too, dialoguing with a text. Yes. And because words are very important to the singer. I'm a, I'm a pianist. I mean, I, when I was uh, playing publicly, um, so I wasn't I wasn't singing. I have sung in church choirs, but now my voice is gone, so I I, I can't do that. Um, what what Well, uh, there's so much repertoire. What voice type are you? A coratura, coratura voice. Coratura voice. Soprano, yeah. Uh, well. A good place to start would be Webern or something like that. The the late op opuses, which are not so immediately attractive. Do you know those? Opus 23 and Opus 25 of Webern? Yes, yes, of course, yeah. Yes. Um, and uh, there's the police officer in Le Grand Macabre by Ligeti, which has a very uh -huh. high soprano part. Um, there's there's a lot of repertoire. I think it depends on your on your personality, and um, because everybody has a different one. And I know, I know a lot of singers, um, and they're all very different. Okay. I've, forgotten what, I've forgotten what the exact question was now. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, because um, I was doing a sequenza three, but this genre is very different as to the opera. But I, I really want to explore this area. That's why I would like to have some, you know, from the opinion from the composer as your very, you know, uh, representative composer as well. The most immediately attractive repertoire for a vocalist is usually written by composers who are let's say theatrical or dramatic mm -hmm. um, because that's the most enjoyable uh, performing style there there is not the range of uh, music even contemporary music for a high soprano uh, which uses the higher register um, that's for historical reasons. There are usually less um, uh, coloratura sopranos than, th than there are dramatic sopranos or lyric sopranos. So the, the classical song repertoire, Schumann and so, uh, and so on, up through Schoenberg and contemporary music. Uh, Wolfgang Riem has, has roles in, in his operas for for coloratura, but you're talking about accompaniment with with orchestra there. And not many people write coloratura songs. I can only immediately think of the Ophelia, um, uh, not the Ophelia, um, there's a set of songs by Strauss, Opus 60 something, uh, which, which has got coloratura in it. Uh, well, there are lots of composers sitting here. You should just send out a bulletin. Please, my, please write me a piece. <laughs> yes, I should it. do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. That's the best and most economical advice. <laughs> just not everybody. Yeah, my husband is one of composers. <laughs> well, there you are. You see, <laughs> yeah. it starts at home. Okay, I work with him. Yeah, very good. <laughs> That's a nice way to end, okay. George. <laughs> Great. Okay. Thank you once again, Michael okay. Finnessy, for a wonderful talk. And uh, thank you for investing so much time with us, uh, going way beyond the original published time. <laughs> so I make a lifestyle of going beyond, George, as you know. <laughs> Absolutely. So, and thank you to everyone for, um, for um, staying to the end and, and for being here all day. Um, uh, and uh, 
thank you for to everyone for your contributions and all the questions and for the papers and from for the moderators um i think from my point of view it's been a really rewarding and interesting day so uh it's been a, a real pleasure from my point of view so th thank you everyone well, you've worked very um, much George. i know how hard you've worked so well done it's, i wish i could have been there but it's not it's not possible these days well next time that's the next symposium oh yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah. yeah okay all right okay have a nice so, <laughs> okay so good have a good morning michael and um Bravo. Great, <laughs> great. <laughs> Okay. Time for the oh, and just a reminder that um, there is actually a set sort of a part two to the symposium which is because of the pandemic we weren't able to have a concert today but we have uh, had confirmation that we have the funding to do recordings of the pieces mm -hmm. so um, so this is the task for July that I'm going to be running around Taiwan um recording the pieces which were selected by the jury so um so that is going to be gradually as we as we finish the the recordings they'll be put up on on the website um so watch this space do keep watching well i'll put up all the material that I, that we've collected from today and everyone who presented today please send your ppts or your um your, your powerpoints or your um you know your um your transcripts to me if you're willing for me to share them on the website um and we'll have a kind of archive of all the material from the day on the website so uh thank thanks again and um and goodbye <laughs> <laughs> goodbye bye okay. good evening bye bye good night Thanks, George. Bye. You're welcome. Goodbye. Bye. Thanks, George. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.